Uh, through our PIs right now, <clears throat> we do have some evidence that Kim Porter may have been poisoned and murdered. The conversation regarding Kim Porter continues. More discussion over her death and the accusation that there wasn't a proper investigation. We're going to catch you up to speed on this aspect of the Sean Combs story and bring back on forensic death investigator Joseph Scott Morgan to get to the bottom of this. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Hey guys, this is a law and crime legal alert. A mother was recently awarded millions of dollars in a lawsuit against baby formula manufacturers after her premature baby was diagnosed with necrotizing enterocolitis or neck after receiving bovine based formula. The lawsuits allege that Enfamil and Similac premature formulas are linked to neck, but manufacturers failed to warn the public of the risks and targeted them with false advertising. So if your premature baby was diagnosed with neck after they were fed Enfamil or Similac, you may qualify for compensation. And one of our legal sponsors is partnering with Wagstaff Law Firm, a national firm renowned for their expertise to ensure that eligible claims are thoroughly presented. Visit babyformuladamages.com slash sidebar to answer less than 10 questions and check your eligibility to file a claim. It's been a minute since we've talked about Kim Porter, right? A key figure in the Sean Combs saga. And with the arrest and indictment of rapper, producer, media mogul Sean Diddy Combs on federal racketeering and sex trafficking charges, there is this renewed interest in all aspects of his life, all the people in his life. And that includes, of course, Kim Porter, Combs' ex-girlfriend, who tragically died in her Los Angeles home back in November of 2018. Officers reportedly found the 47-year-old unresponsive. She was pronounced dead. Now, initially, an autopsy was performed on Porter the next day. And according to the Los Angeles County Medical Examiner's Office, the cause of death was deferred pending additional tests. But then you fast forward to January 2019, and the office then concludes that she died of low bar pneumonia. So the manner of death was listed as natural as opposed to something like homicide. And she'd apparently gone into cardiac arrest. Now, it was reported that she had been battling flu-like symptoms in the days leading up to her death, that there were water bottles, sports drinks, Pedialyte. They were found in her bedroom. Days after her death, Sean Combs commented publicly about Porter's death, writing on Instagram for the last three days. I've been trying to wake up out of this nightmare, but I haven't. I don't know what I'm going to do without you, baby. I miss you so much. Today, I'm going to pay tribute to, to you. I'm going to try and find the words to explain our unexplainable relationship. We were more than best friends. We were more than soulmates. We were some other S. And I miss you so much. Super black love. Combs would reportedly tell Essence Magazine the following year, one night I was checking on her and she was like, Puffy, take care of my babies. She actually said that to me before she died. Now, he's talked about Porter a lot over the years. For example, in 2023, Combs claimed that Porter was the inspiration behind his love album, Off the Grid. He even dedicated a song to her. Now, despite all of this, there have been rumors. There have been unsubstantiated rumors about Kim Porter's death, about what actually happened. And remember, this is a couple that first started dating in the 90s. They had an on-again, off-again relationship. They went through a custody battle over Christian, the son that they had together. They reconcile. They have twin daughters together, Delilah Starr, Jesse James. Combs reportedly cheated on Porter, though. They broke up in 2007. But by all accounts, Porter and Combs seemed to remain close, to be on good terms as parents until her death. And by the way, a little side note, Porter was actually mentioned relatively recently in one of the sexual assault lawsuits that was filed against Sean Combs. This concerned April Lampros, and she claimed that one night in 1996, Combs had forced her and Porter to take ecstasy and have sex with each other as Combs watched and touched himself. And she said afterwards that Combs even invited her to Porter's birthday party. Now, Lampros would also allege that Porter got angry and was resentful of her and helped get her fired from the bar where Lampros was working. So it was really interesting to hear that. But like I said, there have been theories popping up, particularly on Reddit, about Porter's real cause of death, about whether or not she was killed. And one of those people who seems to believe that there is more to the story is Albie Shore. This is Porter's ex. His real name is Albert Joseph Brown. They shared a son together named Quincy. 
Well, after Combs' arrest on federal sex crimes charges, Brown posted on Instagram, In a nutshell, Kimberly was allegedly taken from us because she was set on course to accomplish what Mrs. Cassie Ventura did by igniting the bonfire, which brings us here today. Ventura, of course, is Combs' ex-girlfriend who filed that initial sexual assault sex trafficking lawsuit against Sean Combs last year. It spiraled into multiple other lawsuits and arguably spiraled into these charges that he's now facing today. And Brown wrote, I'm writing this post to formally request an investigation into an entire group of individuals who worked at or around the residence of Miss Kimberly Porter. And he called her death a tragic murder. Now, interestingly, there are reports that I'll be sure has even taken more security measures after asking for an investigation. In fact, he was presented an award at the American Liver Foundation's National Legacy Gala in New York. And in his speech, he says, we even have Homeland Security in the building. Detective Jackson, good to see you. Not entirely sure what he's talking about, what he's referencing, but considering it was Homeland Security that raided Sean Combs' properties in L.A. and Miami and collected all that evidence that federal prosecutors are now using in their criminal case against him, interesting comment to make. Now, Gene Deal, this is Combs' former bodyguard, spoke on the Art of Deal podcast about this, and he said, you got to realize, man, Kim's death wasn't even investigated. He went on to say, how is it that there was no electronic products or gadgets around Kim? Be her laptop missing, her cell phones missing, everything is missing, that she could get in touch with her little girls if they're not at home or her friends or family. All that's missing. How is it that? All that's missing. How is it that? The detectives didn't even examine Porter's body where she passed away. And Deal emphasized, if that is true, that case needs to be reopened. And also in regards to the idea that she got a massage right before her death, he also said, who gives somebody a massage when they get pneumonia? Deal also apparently took issue with the alleged timing of buying her gold casket. He said, how you order a gold casket two months before somebody dies? And he even addressed, I'll be sure, beefing up his security. Al ain't no fool, he's smart by getting extra security. Now with all of this as a backdrop, the last time we talked about Kim Porter on Sidebar is when a book was published on Amazon. It was entitled, Kim's Lost Words, A Journey for Justice from the Other Side. It is allegedly a memoir from Kim Porter herself detailing her relationship with Sean Combs, but it reportedly contains typos, shocking claims, some are saying even inaccurate statements. In fact, Quincy Brown, Christian, Jesse Delilah Combs, they wrote in a joint statement on Instagram, we have seen so many hurtful and false rumors circulating about our parents, Kim Porter and Sean Combs' relationship, as well as about our mom's tragic passing that we feel the need to speak out. Claims that our mom wrote a book are simply untrue. She did not. And anyone claiming to have a manuscript is misrepresenting themselves. And by the way, even Combs authorized his attorney, Erica Wolf to release a statement on his behalf regarding the new book, stating, the Kim Porter memoir is fake. It is also offensive, a shameless attempt to profit from tragedy. Chris Todd has no respect for Miss Porter or her family who deserve better. Unlike the fabrications in his sickening memoir, it is an established fact that Miss Porter died of natural causes. May she rest in peace. And I'll be sure reportedly sent a cease and desist letter to Amazon as well. And Chris Todd, by the way, he's the author. And when we say memoir, we have to be clear here, there's no information verifying that Porter actually authored these writings or authorized a book to be written by her or, any, or anybody else at any point. And even the author really couldn't confirm whether these are actually Porter's words or not, but he seems to believe it's true, claiming that Porter created the information herself on a flash drive, which Todd says she gave to her friends prior to her death. Again, her family, loved ones deny this, but. Either way, interesting to think about. And I sat down with Chris Todd to talk about this, and this is some of what he had to say. Uh, through our PIs right now, <clears throat> we do have some evidence that Kim Porter may have been poisoned and murdered. We need to listen to the people that are online, even these online sleuths, the bloggers. A lot of information comes out from this kind of community, and there's talk of toxins being in her system at first. It was called deferred at first, then it was changed. It's disturbing. It's dark. It's sad. This is an abused woman telling her story. When I first read the whole thing, I only had a couple pages at first. Now, as for the tapes, 
I've been told that I can have access to the tapes. What are the tapes? First start there. What tapes are you talking about? <clears throat> the big one, the big ones. You're talking about sex tapes. Yeah, but with very famous people. Okay, so talk to us about what you were told about the tapes. That if I pass the test, they trust me, I, I will be the one to do it. Who's they? The sources and the, and the, the people around the, the community of Kim and Diddy. And I should tell you that after our interview, Amazon responded to all of this blowback by removing Chris Todd's book from its store. So with all of that in mind, let's revisit this, shall we? I wanna bring in forensic death investigator from Jacksonville State University, Joseph Scott Morgan, host of the Body Bags podcast. I encourage everybody to check it out. Who doesn't wanna hear the soothing voice of Joseph Scott Morgan mm -hmm. for a prolonged period of time? And by the way, we're very lucky because Joseph told us that this is the first recording he is doing from his new studio. And gosh, Joseph, you look phenomenal. Oh, well, thank you, Jesse. It's, it's good to hear that from you. I, uh, a person so stylish as yourself and with the world's best hair, of course. Well, that's uh, very kind Unlike of mine, you. that is graying and not thinning, but it's gray nonetheless. But it looks thanks good. for having it me on. Good. It's always of, a pleasure. Well, thank of course, you. Of, thank of you, course, buddy. Of course. I appreciate it. Um, so listen, I, I'm happy to have you on. We had you on uh, yeah. months ago talking about this. There have been these kind of interesting developments since we last spoke. Uh, first, if you could just tell us again, let's set the stage. Do you have any reason to believe that Kim Porter did not die of low bar pneumonia and whether Porter could have been poisoned in a way to mimic those symptoms? Wow, uh, that's a very highly sophisticated uh, uh a premise, I think, putting out that she could have been poisoned in some way, certainly something that would be undetectable. What I can tell you is that there was um, quite a bit of pathology with her autopsy. And, you know, you'd mentioned just a moment ago that she had died of low bar pneumonia. Um, for folks that don't know, uh, just a brief little primer here. Uh, our lungs uh, are comprised of lobes, okay? So hence low bar pneumonia. Uh, the right lung uh, has three lobes. The left lung has two, all right? And the reason you have two is on the left is because the heart takes up the space. It kind of over overlies the, the lung on that side. Now, her lungs, uh, just so that I have the numbers right, to give you an idea of what we're dealing with here, her lungs uh, were 850 grams for the left, that's the one with only two lobes. And then the right lung was 900 grams. Now that might not mean much to most of the listening public, but I can tell you this, for a woman in particular, um, you alarm bells kind of go off if you get anything that's like up in the upper 400 range. We're talking about the weight of these lungs is desperately heavy. Um, and not only that, but when the lungs were, were dissected at autopsy, they had this kind of um, purulent fluid that came out. And it's just kind of a polite way of saying pus. Uh, she had an ongoing infection. Now, I've investigated a lot of deaths over the course of my career uh, in New Orleans and Atlanta. And I have yet to work a case where someone was able to introduce an agent into someone's system that um, wound up causing a pneumonia and leading to their death. However, <laughs> I, I think one of my biggest questions is, because this is not something that just happened overnight, Jesse. This is a prolonged event. You had um, a physician, a house call physician, uh, and that's the way they're termed, apparently, that was coming out to administer treatment to Miss Porter. Um, how in the world this could have been missed? I, I have no idea. I have had people that are suffering from medical conditions that are in and of themselves lethal, if you, if particularly pneumonia. M pneumonia is very dangerous and left to go untreated. And when I say untreated, she was given like a Z-pack, which is kind of a broad spectrum 
uh, broad spectrum antibiotic, which a lot of people receive. Uh, they give her an IV that is kind of vitamin infused, lots of fluid bottles, they said, trying to do electrolyte re replacement. But once you get this kind of bacterial infection that's going on and you get to the point where your lungs are this heavy and uh, you're producing pus at this point in time, um, I think my big question is, was this neglect? Because, you know, this kind of passive thing that's going on, uh, I, I don't see anything at this point in time that would indicate that she had some kind of trauma. Uh, and if somebody has an indication here, and I'm speaking to those individuals that are insinuating that she was uh, in some way poisoned, my advice is get in contact with the authorities. Let them know this information if you are truly invested in the case relative to solving it. Because you can say all kinds of things, uh, but if you have hard scientific evidence that this occurred, um, then let us know. I also take exception to this idea this, that's being thrown out there, Jesse, that her death was not investigated. Now, I'm, I'm, you know, you mentioned electronic devices, and that's all fine and good. But when you say her death was not investigated, what precisely is meant by that statement? Because I got to tell you, there are a lot of people out there, uh, cases that happen every single day, Jesse, that the medical examiner never puts their hands on those remains. They're never autopsied. They're probably cases in the best set of circumstances. It'd be preferable to do an autopsy. She had an autopsy performed, a thorough autopsy. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I can't speak to how thoroughly her tissues were examined afterwards, but she had a lot of stuff going on with her systemically that would give you an indication that she had some serious, uh, some serious problems going on. And just let me throw this out there to you as well. Her system was not, uh, her metabolism was not working um, in, within normal ranges. And one of the reasons, not only were her lungs heavy, but she had a condition that's referred to as pleural effusion. And so just imagine that your lungs placed in your chest, all right? You have your lungs, your heart right there. And normally that space uh, is referred to as the plural, plural space. Normally that space is, uh, is just open space. When they opened her chest, she had fluid that poured out of that space, okay? And it was a considerable amount uh, that she had coming, coming out of the plural area, they were able to measure it, and it was it was statistically significant. And what happens is with that process, you know, I talked about how heavy the lungs are if you have a pneumonia that's going on. So not only are you having trouble breathing, if anyone's ever had respiratory distress, or if anybody you've ever had a loved one that has pneumonia, it's a horrible thing, a horrible set of conditions to be in. You combine that with pleural effusion. So you have this fluid that's impacting the lung's ability or lack thereof to expand and contract. <laughs> and so she kind of had the double whammy going on there. Yeah. And I'm, I appreciate you not only getting into the specifics of, of what might have happened to her, but also pushing back on the idea that she wasn't investigated because there was an autopsy. And in fact, according to an autopsy report that was obtained by In Touch, I want to read you what this says. She was given Toradol by intramuscular route and was given intravenous fluids, including saline and vitamins. Ms. Porter called this physician the following day and explained she had no appetite. Her nurse visited and gave her more saline solution with vitamins. The next day, she complained to the physician with a streak of blood in her phlegm. She also received a massage. She was watching television with people and subsequently went to bed. She was later found unresponsive and pronounced dead at the scene. And the autopsy revealed fibrinopurulent effusions, infectious mm -hmm. fluids in the chest cavities and yep. uh, pleuritic infection. That's pleural effusion. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. And there was also evidence of lobar pneumonia infection. It was natural with nasophalangreal swabs testing negative for viruses and postmortem right. toxicology results described as unremarkable.
This is yeah. why you're the expert in this and not me. Uh, so, so that's that's very consistent with what you said. And you heard the idea of that you, like you said, the physician coming over. Why wasn't this detected? There seemed to be red warning warning signs. The idea of the massage. Anything? Again, I know there was questions about the massage. But what do you take away from that por portion of the report? Well, again, uh, this is not, uh, and and I would state this plainly uh, under. Normal circumstances, if a clinician were to observe her and begin to understand uh, it, just diagnostically without having drawn labs, okay, in life, uh, you need to you need to get her in for intensive care. Now, I don't mean she needs to be on the ICU, but she needs to be probably on a med surge floor in a hospital. And I'm just wondering where. Why didn't that occur in this particular? And I've got one more bit of information for you here relative to, to the autopsy, which is, is quite telling, uh, Jesse. Uh, something that I had come across that was really, really striking to me was the fact that not only were her lungs heavy uh, and she had pleural effusion, Jesse, she had a condition called hepatomegalia and splenomegalia which means in layman's terms um, that both her spleen and her liver were inflamed and uh, weighed more, more than you would ever expect, particularly when you look at the size of her liver, how big it was. Um, it's striking to get this idea that this is, um, something that was just like an acute event that just like right. happened like this. This had been kind of a, a slow march because it's one thing to develop a pneumonia and you get bilateral uh, low bar pneumonia and uh, the pussy ex exudate and all that sort of thing. But how, how is it explained that her liver gets to this size? And it's a, it's a, a, a desperately, uh, um, difficult condition to overcome. And so you also have the liver that's in this state, and then you have the spleen that's in the state at the same time. Just, just, so just she's got clear. some kind of sy systemic infection that's going on with her. Yeah. Just to be clear about this, low bar pneumonia would cause this. I, you know, I'm thinking that there is a chance that it could. However, no, I think that there's something systemically going on with her. She's oh, had see. health problems, it would seem. I don't know if she's been left undiagnosed, but, you know, the numbers that they're applying here are really way outside of the norms for her. And so when you begin to to see these and you're thinking, you know, I think that any right-thinking clinician would look at this history and, you know, certainly from the gross findings that you had at autopsy, they would say, why, why hadn't she been treated where you know right. where where did this okay. break down but she's getting massages you know and i understand you want relief i mean all of us and uh, you know you want comfort when you're not feeling well and i you know she, a massage would be very nice however she, you know she had she had spiked a temp that was above 102 now it dropped it did drop it went back down to like 96 uh, which is you know a lot of people not everybody runs 98.6 okay i think that a lot of people that's it's kind of the average worldwide, but you know, some people are lower, some people are higher, but she had dropped down to 96. So for whatever reason, at that particular time, uh, you didn't see the spiking continue on with her temp. It had dropped back down, but that doesn't mean that there's not still indwelling infection. But she might have no, had no idea that she was sick. I mean, it, it, no, no fault of her own. No. She might not have known. She might have no, said, no, oh, no. I need and a I'm massage. Saying, right? Yeah, I'm not, I'm certainly not yeah. blaming her on any way. Right. As a matter of fact, this is the moment in time where you have to have somebody that's going to be your advocate <laughs> because sure. yeah. no, uh, for, right. for those that have never had pneumonia, uh, the fever, the, the disorientation that comes along with it, the discomfort, um, you, you're many times you're not in a position to make those kind of treatment decisions for you. So I would ask again, where was her inner circle at this point in time? Who was who was doing watch care over her? And you've got a physician coming to the house. Why was it, was she taken in for a chest x-ray? I mean, that's very basic standard stuff when you're thinking about trying to make your way through treatment of a pneumonia, diagnosis of pneumonia. Most of the time, a clinician will 
have an x-ray, a chest x-ray. I think that most of the people that are hearing this conversation we're having right now, if you've ever had a problem in your chest, particularly pneumonia, they're going to say, we need to get you an x-ray. We want to see yeah. how far this extends. And to my knowledge, it didn't happen. So in other words, we're not saying something nefarious was happening here, but this might have been an underlying condition that was not detected, should have been detected if she had the proper uh, care. Um, let me ask you this. Since the last time we spoke, and I mentioned this before, this gentleman, Chris Todd, wrote a book. And in the book, uh, again, he claims that he believes this is the lost, long lost memoir of Kim Porter, where she documents that she was essentially abused by Sean Combs. And as we heard him say, he believes that there could be evidence that she was killed. You heard the blowback regarding him publishing this book. Uh, I mm -hmm. interviewed him. It was a very interesting, controversial interview. What do you take away from that? Because as we're talking about rumors, we're talking about calls to investigate what happened to her, him publishing this, the sources of how he got this information is interesting. What is just your perspective on it? Well, I, I, I take the view of, of any investigator. Um, I'd have to try to substantiate that data. You know, if you're telling me that she has been abused and more so than that, you're telling me that a homicide has been perpetrated. I want the evidence. I want to know what you know. Give me the information. I want to know how you came about it, who this person is that's saying this, and is it a valid source? That's the big thing. You know, being it because look, investigators deal with this every day. They deal in rumor and innuendo and all kinds yeah. of things. And it can come about in any number of ways. But how do you vet this data that's coming in? Because you know, it's one thing. It's one thing to imply that maybe they've got a bad relationship, that there was abuse in the past. This is, this is a huge leap when you begin to accuse an individual of committing a homicide here. Yeah. You're on a completely different plane at this point. If this individual has this kind of information, come, come forth with it. Let them know. Let the authorities know specifically who killed her? If you know that data, give that to them. The police will run down the leads. And, uh, you know, in fairness to him, I guess the book wasn't, obviously wasn't detailing her death because it was, uh, it was about her own memoirs, her own words, and what she experienced. Uh, before we go, Joseph, I want to ask you one final question real quickly. Yeah. What would it take to reopen an investigation into the death of Kim Porter? How would that even work? Well, it's not, that is not going to begin with the ME. It's going to begin relative to any kind of circumstantial evidence that the police can uncover again, back to any kind of statement. Um, would there be a need, uh, I think in my, in my realm, in the medical legal realm, would there be a need to have her exhumed, uh, for instance? Well, it seems as though that the LA County coroner slash medical examiner, uh, did a relatively thorough job. They're going to have photographs we don't have access to photographs of her at autopsy, her body, uh, making note of any kind of trauma. And keep in mind, Jesse, think about the volume of cases that LA County deals with on a daily basis. I don't know that most people, they're good at picking up on trauma. Yeah. This is what they do for a living. Uh, they would have x-rayed her uh, at that particular time. Um, I don't know how extensive the x-rays would have been. Drew Tox, that came back negative. Um, uh, I think they did cultures as well. Only one of those I think came back positive. Um, and so they, they did the normal standard routine here. Uh, if there's any evidence of trauma to her body and I'm thinking the neck, you know, for instance, um, uh, you know, if there's some kind of trauma to her neck or the back of her head or any, they would have picked up on it at post. Yeah. So it's now going to, the ball would be in the court of, law enforcement relative to reopening the case and they would have to be pre presented with substantive data that would indicate that somebody had a hand in her death other than this being some kind of natural manifestation joseph scott morgan so happy you came back on to talk about this break it down in more depth um again you can check out jo joseph on body bags maybe you're a student of his at uh, jacksonville state university but jo uh, joseph so good to see you thank you so much really really appreciate it all right, my friend. Good to talk to you anytime. All right, everybody. That's all we have for you right now here on Sidebar. Thank you so much for joining us. And as always, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. Speak to you next time. Mm -hmm.